tonight we are going to start, uh, start off by talking about um, Isaiah. And if you've never read the book of Isaiah, it is a long book. And of all the books that um, uh, to go through in a half hour or 45 minute time frame, this is, is not one that you're going to get a comprehensive story. <laughs> So um, the, the book that we're going through, Story Through the Bible, it focuses only on the coming of Jesus. And um, I thought we would take about 10 or 15 minutes. There's a resource online, um, and for just about, if not every, book of the Bible, they have some video clips that they go through, and they, um, they give the synopsis and a little bit about every book of the Bible. And it's, it's called the Bible Project. And we're, uh, so they have actually two videos uh, that cover the book of, of, of Isaiah. And uh, Brent, they're queued up in the, uh, on here after the, uh, should be right after this slide, I think. Um, and so I'm not gonna talk too much about it because then why play the videos, right? So we're going to go ahead and, and uh, start in those, and they should work to, to play out to uh, Facebook as well. So I will sit down while they go about their thing. Period. And he spoke on God's behalf to the leaders of Jerusalem and Judah. He spoke, first of all, a message of God's judgment. He warned Israel's corrupt leaders that their rebellion against their covenant with God would come at a cost. That God was going to use the great empires of Assyria and after them Babylon to judge Jerusalem if they persisted in idolatry and oppression of the poor. But that announcement was combined with a message of hope. Isaiah believed deeply that God would one day fulfill all of his covenant promises, that he would send a king from David's line to establish God's kingdom, remember 2 Samuel 7, that he would lead Israel in obedience to all of the laws of the covenant made at Mount Sinai, remember Exodus chapter 19. And all of this was so that God's blessing and salvation would flow outward to all of the nations, like God promised to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And it's this hope that compares compelled Isaiah to speak out against the corruption and idolatry of Israel in his day. Now, the book has a pretty complex literary design, but there's one simple way to see how it all fits together. Chapters 1 through 39 contain three large sections that develop Isaiah's warning of judgment on Israel. And it all culminates in an event pointed to at the end of chapter 39, the fall of Jerusalem and the exile of the people to Babylon. But in chapters 1 to 39, there's also a message of hope that after the exile, God's covenant promises would all be fulfilled. And chapters 40 to 66 pick up that promise of hope and develops it further. In this video, we're just going to focus on chapters 1 to 39. The first main section focuses on Isaiah's vision of judgment and hope for Jerusalem, and it begins as Isaiah accuses the city's leaders of covenant rebellion, idolatry, injustice, and God says he's going to judge the city by sending the nations to conquer Israel. Isaiah says that this will be like a purifying fire that burns away all that's worthless in Israel in order to create a new Jerusalem that's populated by a remnant that has repented and turned back to God, and Isaiah says that that's when God's kingdom kingdom will come and all nations will come to the temple in Jerusalem and learn of God's justice, bringing about an age of universal peace and harmony. Now, it's this basic storyline of the old Jerusalem purifying judgment into the new Jerusalem. This is going to get repeated over and over throughout the book, getting filled in with increasing detail. So, at the center of this section is Isaiah's grand vision of God sitting on his throne in the temple. And he's surrounded by these heavenly creatures that are shouting that God is holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah suddenly realizes just how corrupt he and his people Israel are. And he's certain that he's going to be destroyed by God's holiness, but he's not. God's holiness, in the form of this burning coal, comes and burns him, but not to destroy. Rather, it purifies him from his sin. And as Isaiah ponders the strange experience, God commissions him with a very difficult task. He is to keep announcing this coming judgment, but because Israel has reached a point of no return, his warnings are going to have a paradoxical effect of hardening the people. But Isaiah is to trust God's plan. Israel is going to be chopped down like a tree and left like a stump 
in a field, and that stump will itself be scorched and burned. But after all of that burning, God says that this smoldering stump is a holy seed that will survive into the future. It's a small sign of hope, but who or what is that holy seed? The rest of this section offers an answer. Isaiah confronts Ahaz, a descendant of David and a king of Jerusalem, and he announces his downfall. God says that it's the great empire of Assyria who will first chop Israel down and devastate the land, but there's hope. Because of God's promise to David, he's going to send after this destruction a new king named Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Emmanuel's kingdom is going to set God's people free from violent, oppressive empires. And Isaiah describes this coming king as a small shoot of new growth that will emerge from the old stump of David's family. It's this king that's the holy seed from chapter 6. And the king is going to be empowered by God's spirit to rule over a new Jerusalem and bring justice for the poor, and all nations will look to this messianic king for guidance. His kingdom will transform all creation, bringing peace. Now, you finish chapters 1 through 12 with a pretty good understanding of Isaiah's message of judgment and hope. But when will this all happen? Isaiah saw another empire arising after Assyria, and that's Babylon, who would also attack Jerusalem and actually succeed in destroying it. And that brings us into the next sections of the book. So first, we have a large collection of poems that explore God's judgment and hope for the nations. We learn, first of all, of the fall of Babylon and Israel's neighbors. Isaiah could see that Assyria's world power would one day be replaced by the empire of Babylon, a nation even more destructive and arrogant. Babylon's kings claimed that they were higher than all other gods, and so God vows to bring Babylon down. And not only Babylon. Isaiah goes on to list Israel's neighbors, accusing them all of the same kind of pride and injustice, and he predicts their ultimate ruin. But remember, for Isaiah, God's judgment is never the final word for Israel or the nations. And that leads into the next section with a series of poems that tell a tale of two cities. There's the lofty city that has exalted itself above God and become corrupt and unjust. This city is an archetype of rebellious humanity and is described with language that's all borrowed from Isaiah's earlier descriptions of Jerusalem and Assyria and Babylon all put together. This city is destined for ruin and one day is going to be replaced by the New Jerusalem, where God reigns as king over a redeemed humanity from all nations, and there's no more death or suffering. These chapters are the climax to this section, and it shows how Isaiah's message pointed far beyond his own day. It was a message for all who are waiting for God to bring his justice on violent, oppressive kingdoms and bring his kingdom of justice and peace and healing love. The following section returns the focus to the rise and fall of Jerusalem. And first we find a whole bunch of poems where Isaiah accuses Jerusalem's leaders for turning to Egypt for military protection against Assyria. He knows this will backfire. And Isaiah says that only trust in their God and repentance can save Israel now. Which gets illustrated by the following story about the rise of Hezekiah, king of Jerusalem. Just as Isaiah predicted, the Assyrian armies come and try to attack the city. And so Hezekiah humbles himself before God and he prays for divine deliverance, and the city is miraculously saved overnight. But Hezekiah's rise is immediately followed by his fall. So he hosts a delegation from Babylon, and he tries to impress them by showing everything in Jerusalem's treasury and temple and palaces. It's clearly an effort to make another political alliance for protection. Isaiah hears about this, and he confronts Hezekiah for his foolishness. He predicts that this ally will one day betray him and return as an enemy to conquer Jerusalem. And we know from 2 Kings chapter 24 and 25 that Isaiah was right. Over a hundred years later, Babylon would turn on Jerusalem, come and destroy the city, its temple, and carry the Israelites away to exile in Babylon. And so all of Isaiah's warnings of divine judgment in chapters 1 to 39 lead up to this moment. He's shown to be a true prophet because it all came to pass like he said. But remember, the purpose of God's judgment was to purify Jerusalem and bring the holy seed and messianic kingdom over all nations. And it's that hope that gets explored in the next part of the book. But for now, that's what Isaiah chapters 1 to 39 are all about. Okay, so that's, that's the first half, okay? And so um, it's interesting to note that 
most, if not all, of the prophets of the Old Testament were killed by the Israelite people. And um, not all of them are detailed in the word how, it's, how uh, they met their demise. But Isaiah, it is, um, it is Lord, that he, uh, he was in a hollowed tree and sawed in half while in, inside this, this hollow tree. Um, and a lot of times what, what, you know, we'll look back and, at, at this and we'll you know, really uh, judge kind of harshly on the, people of the, uh, uh, on the Israelite people of the day. And it was interesting, <clears throat> I walk, was all, walking upstairs, we have a dehumidifier running in one of the offices in the basement. And every time I walk by this, this, this dehumidifier, I'll look down to see what the humidity is in, in, that, in that room uh, to know whether or not it's keeping up, if you know, it's, it's running properly, all those kinds of things. And tonight I walked by and it said 85. I was like, 85% humidity? What is wrong with this thing? And... Um, just as fast as, as, as I thought about this, because it happens like three or four times a month that the same thing will go through, that I'll read it and I'll think, oh, what is wrong with this thing? And I'll realize that the humidifier is backwards to me because of the way the airflow is. And so in, in, in the good old uh, uh, electronic numbers, eights and fives are the same, backwards, forwards, upside down, or right side up. And so it's really 58%. And so it's all a matter of perspective. And so we have the luxury of the perspective of time, right? So here you have a man who is, is uh, foretelling the destruction of the Israelite people, God's chosen people. And because of his foretelling of their destruction, uh, the kings have him, have him killed. For, for heresy and, and just because they're mad at, at the way that, that he's, he's predicting things. And so then you fast forward 100 years and all of a sudden, uh, hey, Isaiah, he was the greatest prophet we've ever had. <laughs> he, he foretold of, of, uh, of when or of that the Israelite people would, would go into exile. He foretold how long they would be in exile, I believe. And then he foretold of the next event about which we are going to listen uh, for the last half of Isaiah. The book of the prophet Isaiah. In the first video, we explored chapters 1 to 39, which was Isaiah's message of judgment and hope for Jerusalem. Chapter 39 concluded with Isaiah predicting Jerusalem's fall to Babylon and the exile. And a hundred years after Isaiah, it all sadly came to pass. But Isaiah's greater hope was for a new purified Jerusalem where God's kingdom would be restored through the future messianic king and all nations would come together in peace. And so chapters 40 and following explore this great hope. The first main section, chapters 40 to 48, open with an announcement of hope and comfort for Israel. The people are told that the Babylonian exile is over and that Israel's sin has been dealt with, a new era is beginning. So they should all return home to Jerusalem where God himself will bring his kingdom and all nations will see his glory. Now, let's stop for a moment because this opening announcement raises a big question, that is, who is saying all of this? Whose voice are we hearing in these words of hope? The perspective of the prophet in these chapters is that of somebody who's living after the exile, in other words, in the time period described by Ezra and Nehemiah. But Isaiah died 150 years before any of that. So what are we supposed to make of this? Well, there are many who think that it's still Isaiah in his own day speaking, but that he's been prophetically transported, so to speak, 200 years into the future, and that he's speaking to the future generations as if the exile is past. However, the book of Isaiah itself gives us some clues that something else is probably going on. In chapters 8 and 29 and 30, we're told that after Isaiah was rejected by Israel's leaders, that he wrote and sealed up in a scroll all of his messages of judgment and hope, and that he passed it on to his disciples as a witness for days to come. 
Eventually, Isaiah died, waiting for God to vindicate his words. Now remember, chapters 1 to 39 were designed to show us that Isaiah's predictions of judgment were fulfilled in the exile. He's a true prophet. And so after exile is over, Isaiah's disciples, who have treasured his words for so long, open up the scroll and begin applying his words of hope to their own day. So on this view, the book of Isaiah consists of that first collection of Isaiah's words, as well as the writings of his prophetic disciples that God uses to extend Isaiah's message of hope to future generations. Whichever view you end up taking, everybody agrees that these chapters are announcing that the future hope has come, that God is fulfilling Isaiah's prophetic promises. And so the prophet hopes that Israel will respond by becoming God's servant. That is, after experiencing God's justice and mercy through history, that they will now begin to share with the nations who God truly is. But that's not what's happening. Israel, instead of bearing witness to the nations, is actually complaining and even accusing God. They say, the Lord doesn't pay attention to our trouble. In fact, he's ignoring our cause. The Babylonian exile, understandably, caused Israel to lose faith in their God. I mean, maybe he's not that powerful. Maybe the gods of Babylon are way greater than our God. And so the rest of these chapters, 41 to 47, are set up like a trial scene. God is responding to these doubts and accusations with the following arguments. He says first that the exile to Babylon was not divine neglect. Rather, it was divinely orchestrated as a judgment for Israel's sin. And second, it was for Israel's sake that God raised up Persia to conquer Babylon so they could come back home fulfilling Isaiah's words. So the right conclusion that Israel should draw is that their God is the king of history, not the idols of the nations. In the fall of Babylon and the rise of the Persian king Cyrus, Israel should see God's hand at work and so become his servant, telling the nations who he is. But by the end of the trial, chapter 48, we find that Israel is still as rebellious and hard-hearted as their ancestors. And so God disqualifies them as his servant, but God still is on a mission to bless the nations. And so the prophet says God's going to do a new thing to solve this problem, which moves into the next section, 49 to 55. We're introduced to a figure who's called God's servant, who's going to fulfill God's mission and do what Israel has failed to do. God gives this servant the title Israel and sends this person on a mission to, first of all, restore the people of Israel back to their God, but second, to become God's light to the nations. And we're told that this servant is empowered by God's spirit to announce good news and to bring God's kingdom over all of the nations. It sounds just like the Messianic king from chapters 9 and 11. But then we learn the surprising way of how the servant will bring God's kingdom. He's going to be rejected and beaten and ultimately killed by his own people. In reality, as he's being accused and sentenced to death, he's dying on behalf of the sin of his own people. The prophet says the servant's death is a sacrifice of atonement for the people's evil and rebellion. And then, after his death, all of a sudden, the servant is just alive again. And we hear that by his death, he provided a way to make people righteous. That is, to put them in a right relationship with God. And so this section concludes by describing two ways people can respond to the servant. Some will respond with humility and turn from their sins and accept what God's servant did on their behalf. These people are called the servants and also the seed. Remember the Holy Seed? from chapter 6. These are the ones who will experience the blessing of the messianic kingdom. But there are others who are called simply the wicked, and they reject both the servant and his servants. Which brings us to the final section of the book, 56 to 66, where the servants inherit God's kingdom. These chapters are beautifully designed as a symmetry that brings together all of the themes of the book. At the very center are three beautiful poems that describe how the spirit-empowered servant is announcing the good news of God's kingdom to the poor. And he reaffirms all of the promises of hope from earlier in the book. The new Jerusalem, inhabited by God's servants, will be the place from which God's justice and mercy and blessing flow out to all the nations of the world. And surrounding these poems are two long prayers of repentance, where the servants confess Israel's sin, and they grieve over all of the evil they see in the world 
world around them. And so they asked God to forgive them and that his kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. Now on each side of these prayers are collections of more poems that contrast the destiny of the servants with that of the wicked who persecute them. God says he's going to bring his justice on all who pollute his good world with their evil and selfishness and idolatry and that he's going to remove them from his city forever. But the servants, those who are humble before God and who repent and own their evil, they are forgiven and they will inherit the new Jerusalem, which we discover is an image for an entirely renewed creation where death and suffering are gone forever. And this brings us to the very outer frame of this part of the book. In this renewed world of God's kingdom, people from all nations are invited to come and join the servants of God's covenant family so that everyone can know their creator and redeemer. And so the book of Isaiah ends with the very grand vision of the fulfillment of all of God's covenant promises. Through the suffering servant king, God creates a covenant family of all nations who are awaiting the hope of God's justice in bringing a renewed creation, where God's kingdom finally comes here on earth as it is in heaven. And that's the very powerful hope of the book of Isaiah. So judgment and hope, two very uh, contrasting stories that were all put, uh, put forward by the prophet Isaiah. And um, a couple of, of interesting things of note. So when you read especially this last half of the book of Assyrian, Babylonian, and I can't think of the ones after the Babylons uh, that, that put them in, into exile, but who, um, you know, Ezekiel talked about the wheel and the wheel. And, um, uh, but there was a comment that was made in, in the video that said the last half of Isaiah was as if Isaiah was trans transported to the future to see what was going to happen and to write to those generations. Okay, so if we think about in that context... Who else, who else do we think of that, that did similar, similar writings? Okay, John's revelation, revelation and Daniel, okay? And it's interesting, bo all three of these writers uh, wrote about that same event, okay? So you have, you have Isaiah, he's, he's first on, on the forefront, and he writes about... Uh, the, the coming of Jesus, he writes about um, that he would, he would be uh, the Messiah, the Messianic King, as they referred to him in, in, the, in the video, and that he, um, he would be celebrated, and then he would be despised and rejected and killed on the, on a, uh, killed on the cross as a sacrifice, and then he would raise again, and then there would be uh, there would be a, a Jerusalem would be destroyed, new Jerusalem and a new heaven, or a new earth, and all the people of the, of the earth would have a way to be redeemed through Jesus. Um, now it's interesting. Uh, did you catch that that part about the the tree that was that was cut that was cut off? Okay, what what did that tree represent? Okay, the people of Israel. What's that? It was it was a representation of David's family being cut off from being the rulers of of Egypt or Egypt, of Israel. <laughs> okay, and um, and then Isaiah later on refers back to that stump and talks about this small shoot that's going to come off of it. And that, from that shoot is where the, this messianic king would rise again. And so um, when we move, you know, move forward and, and uh, you know, we're, we're almost halfway through the year and not a lot of people start thinking about Christmas yet, but... Um, uh, June and July, I, I, I start thinking about when we, when we start talking of the coming of Christ. And Isaiah is where, where uh, so many sermons come back to because it talks about 
in, in, uh, in a lot of detail how Jesus would come. Um, For unto you a child is born, unto you a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace, right? Um, Handel's Messiah is, uh, is, is well known for using that text in, in, in lyrical form, format for music, right? And um, so here we are, close to 3,000 years later, I think it was 750 years before, uh, before Christ uh, came that, that Isaiah wrote this. And so, um, so when we sit back and we see the detail in which the Holy Spirit can, can reveal to someone what what does that what does that conjure in, in your mind? What does it make make you think about when you start to realize um, through the power of the Holy Spirit what what we His people can do? There's no limit to what we can do through the Holy Spirit. We can be confident that God's purposes and plans will, will come to pass. And um, well, let's just let's, um, at the beginning of, of the videos, the first in the first video, what was it that that Isaiah said judgment would be used for? What was the purpose of judgment? It was for purification, right? It was, it was for justification, and it was, it was to bring them back. And it's interesting to me, anyway, that Isaiah put himself in the same place and in, in the same level of sustainability to God as the other leaders of, of that city. Um, because uh, it talked about the, the vision of the coal coming to his mouth, and... Um, when he saw all of this, he, him, he, he said, I, I'm going to die. I'm going to die right here because I'm just as evil and horrible and wicked as any of these other people. And that is what the presence of the Lord is, uh, will do, is uh, the light of, of truth is going to shine on us. And, and we will know at that moment that um, we, we are, are sinful, wicked, and despicable people. But the reality is that Jesus came so that we could uh, be redeemed. Okay? Um, it, it, Isaiah uh, mentions about uh, uh, that Christ w is the light of the world. Okay? Okay, so later on uh, in here, when it talks about when Jesus came, uh, no, let me, it's beyond that. It's when the, the messianic king, so it was, it, it's after Jesus' crucifixion, and it would be when he comes to rule again. Um, it, it talked about, uh, no, I'm, that's too far. So it's, it's basically in, in, today's, in today's time. So what are the reactions to the messianic king? There's, there's two, two reactions. One was to do what? One was to believe and accept him, and one was to, to scorn and reject him, right? So what, did, what was the names that they gave to the people who... Uh, who <laughs> uh, all right, so I'm going to open it up for, for questions now. <laughs> 
because anytime that there there is a book like like Isaiah Dan, uh, Daniel is coming up next week, you know, Revelation is always the big one. I used used to do this with with Royal Rangers, and I would just uh, have a stump Mr. Lonnie night is what I would call it, and they could just come up with any question out of the Bible that they wanted to, and by and large they came out of Revelation because that's what uh, we quit talking about. When I was a kid, it was like every four months you heard about Revelation. <laughs> you heard about the time of judgment. But, uh, um, so anyway, what, what questions about, about Isaiah and what we've heard that sparked interest or comment or whatever? And we'll come around with, with the microphone so that uh, any of the folks out in the Facebook land can, can hear as well. Just raise your hand when you have a question or a comment. What's that? <laughs> I don't think anybody really has Isaiah down. Anytime you get you get into these guys that that uh, use such vivid imagery, there's so much put into those images. It's it's uh, now now Isaiah he's he's pretty straight, straightforward in his imagery, but. Um, Well, then we'll go to the books for a couple, a book for a couple of, of questions. Um, so it talked about that Jesus was the servant sufferer. Okay? He was the servant that came to, to call people to God and was and suffered for us. He came to serve us, to suffer for us. So, um, why did we need a servant sufferer? Okay, partly so we don't suffer. The sacrifices weren't enough. We were not without spot or blemish, and so there was no sacrifice that, that would work. The sacrifice had to be truly was given to us so that we could follow it to get to God. And that's not the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was to show us how sinful we are. And when Jesus was here, and, and every time somebody asked him about the law, and and they and well you know follow this and this and this and this oh yes I followed all of that well have you ever had uh, have you ever hated someone well yes well hatred is the same as 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 killing them I mean he would he would draw those correlations and now all of a sudden when Jesus is is explaining the law it becomes crystal clear to all of them that nobody is is righteous and that nothing that we can do through the law can get us to God, and that we need a Redeemer. We need a Messiah, and that was why Jesus came. That was why he had to die. Um, that's why when, when uh, Judas was struggling, you know, in the garden with the kiss uh, that was going to indicate to the, to the Romans who, who to arrest, Jesus had to coax him on. Come on, do what you, do what you came to do. And... Um, and so, uh, it's kind of mind-boggling when, when you really think, think about it, the, the lengths that Jesus went to in order to assure that he would be crucified. What do these prophecies tell us about God's plan to redeem humanity? Humanity. 
Yes, his, his plan was always in place. And uh, when I was talking about the stump, I meant to mention this as well. When we talked about at the fall, way back when we started this whole path, um, and God was talking to Satan and Adam and Eve, he said, don't worry, there will be, be one that will come that, that, will, that will redeem you. And when he was talking to Satan, he said that the seed of Eve would crush the serpent's head. And so it's interesting now, you know, fast forward these 1,200 years, whatever, whatever the time frame is, 1,500 years, um, going back to the, to the stump, what did they call the stump? Again, they called it the seed. Okay, and so if if we if we follow this through through Scripture, we always see that that word seed, when when they're talking about redemption, always trails to Jesus. And so, um, it's it, it's it's just interesting how. Uh, Before the Old Testament was written down, it was passed through word, right? And so from the time they were little till they were eight, they would, they would recite the different scriptures and they would memorize them and they would have them written on their heart, right? And, uh, <laughs> and so they knew about these, uh, about these word lines, how it would string through. And I know I've, I've mentioned a few times about uh, this, this study that we're going through. It's intended to show that the Old Testament, the purpose of the Old Testament was to point us to Christ, and the purpose of the New Testament was to point us to Christ. And anybody who thinks that we can't have, that, that we can just go with the, the New Testament or just go with the Old Testament um, is 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 foolish because when Jesus for those who say that the, the Old Testament isn't isn't valid um, what did Jesus quote all the time the Old Testament and so if you have Jesus that's using the Old Testament to point to himself that's proof enough <laughs> Today in your hearing, this this has this has been fulfilled. Yep. Yep. And the um, the in the video they talked they talked about that that Isaiah had his disciples. Okay, all, all of these different um, men of God had their disciples, and they they wrote down what was said, and they carried carried it along for the for the time until their prophecies came to pass. And now the the um, the teachers of 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 the word would accept them as as. Uh, pro prophecy because they've come to pass and so you can't deny it anymore everything everything Isaiah said came to pass you can't can't deny him as a prophet anymore sorry we sawed you in half <laughs> so um, but I want to bring us back to perspective because today that's what we seem to have a hard time with is perspective um, when we look at look at our world and we look at the things that that uh, people are angry about, people are are disgusted with, people are uh, remorseful of, you know, whatever phrase you want to use, the reality is that there's a perspective that's missing, and it's easy to look back and to and to to judge based on a perspective of another. <laughs> 
20 or 60 or 100 or 1,000 years of history, right? It's easy to look back and, and see, uh, you know, you crazy Israelites, you killed this great man of God just because he was telling you what God had, what God wanted you to hear. And so, as you, as you go through your life and you start to hear, um, start to hear the Holy Spirit prompting you for, uh, for different things through your life, I want you to think about that upside down humidistat. That even though it may not look right to you right now, keep pondering it in your mind because you just might end up walking to the other side of that humidistat and realize, oh my goodness, that telling was right. And um, so as, as, as you're going through and you hear things about the word that may, that may be a little different, when we're talking about the, uh, the filters that we have, have had placed in our, in our minds through previous teachings, previous um, uh, experiences, previous parents, previous family, friends, whomever, enemies, remember that that perspective, that filter, could be put in upside down. All right, we will close tonight just with a short prayer, and uh, we will be dismissed.